Nerd Night. A, B, C, D, W, T, F. Things you probably didn't know about classic kids' books. All right, well, so uh, I feel like I'm a pretty good person to talk about kids' literature. Um, I have a, a background in K-12 education, and I've also worked in public libraries directly with kids and with children's literature for, uh, for quite a lot, of, a lot of time. So uh, my talk for you tonight is A, B, C, D, W, T, F the things that you may not have known about children's literature. I know that this is a super educated town, but I'm hoping to surprise some of you, so if you learn something really cool tonight, come talk to me about it afterward, because I would love to chat with you. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off with a very popular book. Um, so, wow, I was expecting people to go like, oh, where the wild things are, like, oh. Um, <laughs> so I'm hoping you already know this book. Um, because what we do at story time with like the preschoolers is they tend to do like, oh, when they see the book they know and love. And so we ask them to like raise their hands, like who knows this one? But um, I don't, so I like a lot of audience participation. So just like go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you for indulging me. So the first author I'm gonna talk about is of course Maurice Sendak. And like what a kooky guy. Um, he's been on record as just saying like some hilarious things. He's such a grump, so lovable. And the, the interesting thing about where the wild things are is that it didn't always start as wild things. Uh, actually, when he set out to write this book, he originally intended it to be where the wild horses are. And well, okay, so here's audience participation again. Raise your hand if you can't draw horses. That's me. When I draw a horse, it looks like a hot dog with two toothpicks coming out of it. And that's how I imagine Maurice Sendak did it because his publisher said to him like, Hey Maurice, this is how I imagine his voice being like, hey Maurice, so you can't drop horses, but can you drop things? And he was like, yeah, I can drop things. And so he, he made Where the Wild Things Are, and in an interview, he openly told someone that he based the wild things on his family. Like, can you, yeah, like, can you imagine that dinner conversation? Like, good luck, Maurice, okay. Well, so he's not the only one. Oh, and of course, I have to show you my Photoshop skills. I almost forgot. Oh, I'd be depriving you. So I had to wonder though, like what would, where the wild horses are actually look, but I, again, I can't draw horses. So I just like filled it in with some of my favorite. I feel like it would look like this, but like Bojack wouldn't bring, bring the blues. I mean, that's, that's inappropriate Bojack. Why would you do that? Okay, moving on. So another animal story, whoa, The Hungry Caterpillar by Eric Carle. So Eric Carle was an absolutely incredible illustrator. What he did to create the images that you see in this book um, was that he would take pieces of paper and paint them and then cut them apart again. He would die cut them. Can you imagine like painting a piece of paper and then cutting it apart into discrete bits and putting it back together into a, like this mosaic book? Well, that's what he did, which I admire greatly. Uh, but the hungry caterpillar, like where the wild things are, didn't start out as a caterpillar. He actually wanted this book to be a week with Willie the Worm, which <laughs> fell flat with the publisher. Uh, the publisher said, you know, uh, worms are boring. Can you make it a butterfly? And he said, like, mm, there's no character development. Can it be a caterpillar? And they said, yeah. So it became the very hungry caterpillar. But again, you know, I just, I have this imagination. I can't draw worms. And so I just had to wonder, what would a week with Willie the Worm look like? And so, again, I can't draw worms. So I found Lowly Worm. He's part of Richard Scarry's books. And if you don't know Richard Scarry, he's the guy who writes books about like cities and people and buildings and things. I know that totally helps the description here. But Lowly Worm, he rides an end in an apple car. He's awesome. So here's my version of a week with Willie the Worm. Of course, it starts with Lowly Worm on a Monday. I imagine, I'm here I'm setting the scene here. He's a copy editor, he works at a coffee shop, and of course he only uses Apple technology because he rides in an Apple car. I mean, that just makes sense, that's logical. <laughs> Tuesday, he's actually bought the coffee. Don't know why he didn't do that on day one, but that's fine. Wednesday, he's got the blue screen of death. All the errors are happening. He's on his iPhone with tech support. That's not good. Everything's on fire on Thursday. He's got his pyramid of coffee, and by Friday, he's just raving it up in his fedora. So now we know what a week with Willie the Worm would look like. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna move on to another animal story. Can you see kind of the, there are lots and lots of books for kids with animals. I think it, well, part of it I think is to be politically correct um, because it's, it's easy to draw animals as characters and you can kind of fill all of the gaps 
in terms of representation, um, but it's also really fun. So uh, Corduroy by Don Freeman, um, as you can guess, didn't originally start as a bear. Corduroy started as a human boy, so this gets just like totally different. Corduroy started as Corduroy, the inferior decorator. I'm gonna say that again, it's the inferior decorator with an S. So it was a story about this boy, I'm seriously not kidding. Like I know that I made up Willie the Worm and I made up like the Bojack Horseman with, with the, okay, I know that that was a fabrication, but everything that I say that I'm, I'm telling you is real is totally real, you can look it up, it's online, it's real. And I just like can't believe the words I'm gonna say, but Corduroy the Inferior Decorator was about a boy who would not stop painting the inside of his parents' house, no matter how much they told him not to, which I kind of feel like that's, that's free work. Like you can just give the kid like an eggshell white and you're good to go, but <laughs> fine. So he wouldn't stop painting the house and dad was like, you should stop painting. Which by the way, their last name, I seriously am not kidding, is Schizophroid. <laughs> okay, John Freeman, okay. So dad tells him to stop painting the house and mother's like, oh, but we shouldn't quash his joy. So you can know, you'll know how that turns out. But the amazing thing is that on Don Freeman's website, like I'm pretty sure his son now writes for him on his website, but they freely admit that this book is completely in the manuscript, ready to publish, and they just haven't put it out into the world yet. So you can hope that maybe one day they'll release it to the world, but for the time being, you can go on Don Freeman's website and you can listen to a clip of someone reading an excerpt of it to jazz. <laughs> yeah, just when you thought the internet couldn't get better. So, trust me, it's worth it. This is what I imagine Corduroy the Inferior Decorator, how I imagine him doing the house. I mean, it's not that bad, but okay. Harold and the Purple Crayon. So Harold and the Purple Crayon was drawn and written by Crockett Johnson, who was known for illustrations in many books. Uh, he's known for illustrating The Carrot Seed by his wife, Ruth Krauss, for Barnaby, and you might notice something similar across all of the illustrations of these people. Yes, they're short white boys, yes, but also they're bald. And I know you might think, okay, the kid in the carrot seed has some lumps, that's the implication of hair. No, those are head lumps because kids fall down a lot. No, all of these kids are bald. And Crockett Johnson, which by the way is a pen name, like this guy chose to be named Crockett Johnson, but that's, okay. So he openly said in an interview, that it was intentional to draw all of the children that he drew as bald. And when asked why, he gave three reasons. The first reason is that he himself is bald. So like you draw characters in your own likeness, okay, kind of egotistical, but eh, I get it, okay. The second reason is because it's apparently hard to draw children with hair. <laughs> like three lines to do it, man, okay. The third reason is because Crockett Johnson thought that people with hair looked funny. So for anybody bald in this audience, good on you, because Crockett Johnson likes you. <laughs> All right. Well, I think if the, if the whole world were overrun with bald toddlers, we would just end up with Caillou, who's the worst TV toddler of all time. So I'm really glad that we don't have a world full of bald toddlers. Okay, I'm gonna move on to a very popular author, uh, Shel Silverstein. He is just a can of worms ready to be opened. So Shel Silverstein is widely known for his most famous book, The Giving Tree, which I'm not gonna get into tonight for the sake of time, but The Giving Tree is a highly controversial book, and if you don't know about the controversy, in a nutshell, it's that um, the emotional relationship between the boy and the tree can either be seen as generous or abusive. So look into it in your free time if you're interested because it's fascinating. But um, he was well known for the giving tree, for where the sidewalk ends, for all of these, this beautiful, um, whimsical poetry for children. And what people often don't know about Shel Silverstein is that he spent a long period of his life producing work solely for adults. He spent over 20 years being the resident cartoonist for Playboy. <laughs> and not just like being the cartoonist for Playboy, like he spent a lot of time in the Chicago Playboy Mansion being buddies with Hugh Hefner and hitting on all the bunnies. Like he was in it. Like 
in that deep. He was really into Playboy for a while, but you can look this up, I swear I'm not lying. Also, Shel Silverstein, again, he produced lots of content for adults. He wrote musicals, he wrote plays, he wrote epic poetry, poetry about getting high. You can look into that one, that's not mine. Um, but something that fascinated me most was that he produced and performed nine albums, music albums, for adults. And one of them, I have the Amazon listing for it, it's gonna be kinda hard to see because it's a PowerPoint, but this one is called Freakin' at the Freakers Ball. <laughs> and if you are interested, you can pay over $100 on Amazon for a copy. So, uh, some of the tracks, as you can tell from people who are sitting up front here, uh, one of the tracks is uh, Masochistic Baby. Along with Polly and Aporty, I'm not lying, this is an Amazon listing. But the, the weirdest, creepiest thing about this listing for this album is that track number three is Sarah Cynthia Sylvia Stout would not take the garbage out. <laughs> what? Like, that is a children's poem in one of his children's poetry books. Like, it makes me question everything I know about life. Like, what does that poem mean if he's got it on his adult album called Freakin' at the Freakers Ball. Like, I just can't sleep at night because I'm wondering this. But like, okay, Shell, all right. He's something else, just something else. Okay, so I was gonna talk about Frog and Toad. We don't have enough time because I put like, I ended up finding way too much information. But basically, what it boils down to is that Frog and Toad are the shit. And as an adult, if you have time, because I know adults don't have time, Please go and find a Frog and Toad book. I guarantee you that it's at your public library. Multiple copies in varying degrees of disrepair because children love them, but adults do too. And Toad is amazing. Like Toad is the representation of every adult ever who just like wants to make it in the world, but isn't quite there yet because everyone's just trying so hard and he's, he's on a diet and he just wants to like eat a piece of cake. <laughs> I'm not kidding about that one either. Frog and Toad are the best. Okay. Oh! It's here. I can't see Sarah, but I told her that I didn't include this as part of my slides, but it's here. I can read you the quote of Frog and Toad. I'm just going to read the bottom one, but it's from a story called Cookies. Now, we have no more... Oh, I need to do my Toad voice. What am I doing here? Okay. Now we have no more cookies to eat, said Toad sadly. Not even one. Y yes, said Frog. But we have lots and lots of willpower. You may keep it all, Frog, said Toad. I'm going home now to bake a cake. <laughs> what a real guy. Gotta love Toad. Oh, he's my favorite. Okay, so my next slide is about Amelia Bedelia. And if you don't know Amelia Bedelia, she's amazing and also super annoying. So she was in Readers, which are actually evolutionary for, for what they are. Um, I won't get into too much of the history, but Readers have come such a long way. They used to have primers like Dick and Jane, like Sea, Dog, Run, uh, which are super boring. And now there are books like Amelia Bedelia and, and these books that have a story to them that are actually engaging, that encourage kids to read. And Amelia Bedelia is another level entirely because she teaches people about learning a language and developing a sense of humor with idioms. Um, so idioms, if you're not familiar, I mean, this is the most educated town in the like, United States, but. You don't know what an idiom is, it's like a it's a it's a phrase or expression that doesn't necessarily mean what it literally says, right? And of course Amelia Bedelia takes it literally, and well, every you know, all hell breaks breaks loose. But I saw a comment online that really just sparked my imagination, and they said that Amelia Bedelia might have been really great on Pinterest because there was a book that, that she was asked to make make cheesecake. And she took several wheels of cheese and put them together to make a cake. And I thought to myself, oh, Amelia Bedelia is the next Pinterest superstar. <laughs> she is. You'll believe me when you see this. Okay, so she was told to put out the lights. And so she did. Wait for this, right? This is real on Pinterest. <laughs> Amelia Bedelia could have planned the most rustic wedding. She was also told to make food for the baby. And so she made baby hamburgers, baby potatoes, baby tomatoes. And those of you who have been on Facebook lately and have seen all of the tiny food that comes up in memes, look at this. She was on top of that. 
She knew what was up. She knew. It's toad size. It's toad size, yeah. And of course she was told to dress the chicken, which looks really ridiculous here, but mostly because of the color scheme, whatever else. Because when you see this, like, yeah, Amelia Bedelia knew what she was doing. She could have planned weddings, I'm convinced. She would have had such a following. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to banned books. Um, banned books are a topic that come up pretty frequently around this time of year, especially come September. Um, many libraries kind of come to the front to talk about banned books and censorship, um, especially the American Library Association talks about it because it's, uh, it's an infringement on, on the freedom to information. And um, when very well-meaning members of community ask that a book be taken out of a public library or a school curriculum or something like that, um, yes, they mean really well by, by not by sheltering everybody, right? And, and making sure that certain kids don't read things that they maybe find questionable. But that's up to everybody, right? We can all decide, I know, my liberal agenda, but we can all, we all have a right to decide what information is, is valid and what we value. And so censorship can kind of can hurt that. Um, so anyway, I'm not gonna get down in the dumps about like sad stories of banned books, that's not what I'm about. So I'm gonna talk about hilarious times that books have been banned. And I'm gonna start with Where's Waldo. <laughs> you can believe it. The very first Where's Waldo book has been banned and has been republished because of the banning. And the reason for it is because well, I like to explain Where's Waldo as the guy who dresses like he's in Weezer and is in the center of Lollapalooza, right? Like just constantly. And so there's a page in the Where's Waldo original book that has a beach scene. Tons and tons of people, and of course, every single image of a person is like smaller than your thumbnail. So just like imagine how small this is. But someone happened to pick out the fact that a woman is innocently reading a book, topless, but like face down. So all you see is like minor side boob. But someone did not like this, and so they banned the book, and it's actually been republished, and now she has a very tasteful bikini top. So if you look for a newly published version of this book, you're not gonna find what you're looking for. Just Google it online, I know you want to. It's not that exciting. Next up is Hop on Pop by Dr. Seuss. I know what you're probably thinking because I had the same thought and the thought is, oh, it's racism. But no, I remember I said this was hilarious. Okay, so yes, many of Dr. Seuss's books are totally racist, I hear you. But Hop on Pop has actually also been banned because it incites violence to fathers everywhere. <laughs> Get off dad's belly, leave it alone. For real, it was banned for that reason. But to be fair, I was thinking about it and I was like, that's so unfair, like this is an innocent kid's book. But when I was a kid, I would wait till my dad would fall asleep because naps are important for families. Good job, dads, you're amazing. And uh, I'd wait till he'd fall asleep and then I'd walk up to him really quietly and like wrench open his eyes and say, wake up, dad. And he did. And I'd laugh. And somehow he had the grace and poise to deal with that like multiple times throughout my childhood. Thanks, Dad, you're amazing. <laughs> but also, I did read this book a lot, so draw your own conclusions there. Um... Okay, and finally, the last grouping of children's books I'm gonna talk about are threefold. There's Alice in Wonderland, there's Charlotte's Bud, and Winnie the Pooh. What do they all have in common? They have talking animals. Talking animals are a disgrace. They are too close to human beings, and they just they, they shouldn't talk. That's unnatural. So they, all of these books have been banned for that reason. Okay, I have one last thought for you before I get off the stage and let all of our wonderful other presenters get up here and tell you about amazing things. So my last thought is that it's okay to read kids' books. As in all of the adults in this room, not to a child, not for a you, you totally can, that's amazing, that's right. But you can also read them for yourself, that's okay. And also, I know the thought that tends to go through people's minds because I've worked in public libraries and I've also known people who go to public libraries. And I know the, uh, the, the frequent thought is, oh, but if I walk into the kids section, they're gonna see me as a creep and they're gonna give me the eye, like, oh, get out of here, no. like. If you're the person who's worried about that, you're not the creep. You're not the one that they're worried about. There are people who walk in by themselves all the time, men, women, any gender, adults, 
who walk in to grab their DVD because they really miss watching Up because who doesn't like Up and a little bit of crying sometimes? And who doesn't want to get a little nostalgic with the book, right? So it's okay, no one's judging you. Go and read kids' books because, of course, I gotta include LeVar Burton somewhere because I'm assuming, so I know that we're recording this, so I know LeVar Burton is totally watching this, so hi, LeVar, I love you. Um, but, you know, there are great benefits to reading kids' books. You can get an overview on a topic, like let's say that you wanna just like beef up for trivia night, um, maybe you want to like impress your girlfriend because she's a total civil war buff and you just like need to know a thing about it. Um, maybe you just like want a quick recipe and you want some pictures to go with it. Maybe you're like me and you like dinosaurs and Harry Potter and they don't really make books for adults like that. But no matter what, you can find really great overviews on topics. It's awesome. Also, you can get just a good quick laugh out of kids' graphic novels, which is what Jersey and Anne are gonna talk about later, I'm so excited about it. But seriously, kids' graphic novels are amazing and many of them are super funny and they're really quick. You can just spend like 15 minutes on your lunch break, read some Lunch Lady, love Lunch Lady, and you just get your quick lesson. in, it's awesome. My last thought is, of course, to just get a little nostalgic, right? So if by this talk you started thinking about some of your favorite books from growing up, then go find it. Like, go on Amazon, maybe it's out of print, that's okay. Um, Find it used somewhere, I'm sure it exists somewhere. Or go to your public library, go to Barnes Noble, wherever you consume your books. But like go find it and, and get that feeling again of, of reading when you're a kid and just like absorbing that childhood memory, right? And who knows, maybe if you Google it, you'll find out something hilarious about the author in the process. So thanks very much. This program was recorded on August 16th, 2018 at Live. 102 South 1st Street, Ann Arbor, Michigan.